Well, I'm Dave Kletter, and uh, I'm executive director with Driftless Area Land Conservancy. Uh, we're a nonprofit conservation organization based here uh, in Dodgeville. And um, thank you for being here on a Friday evening. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, again, thanks to all the, the great partners who have put this together. This has really been a terrific event, and I've, I've learned a ton. And so thank you all for uh, uh, you know, all you've provided uh, to really strengthen our cause. Um, this evening, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about a few things. Um, if, if you were here this afternoon, I gave sort of an abridged version of this. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the natural, historic, archaeological resources of the Driftless area, uh, the economic impacts uh, to this region. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the environmental impact statement and steps and our, our attorneys uh, with the Environmental Law and Policy Center are here to hold my hand <laughs> and uh, slap it if I say something <laughs> wrong. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about intervener, intervener status and then, and then we'll close. Um, but uh, why don't we start? So I'm, I'm just going to give you a, uh, I, I showed this earlier today, but this is the Driftless Area. For those of you who don't know what the Driftless Area is, it is an area without glacial drift. So all the glaciers, the, you know, the uh, Wisconsin lobe came down here, and the Illinoisan lobe came down here, and the, you know, Missourian lobe came down here, but they never came into the Driftless area. So this is a very old, ancient landscape. I shouldn't say ever. In the last couple million years, uh, glaciers have not come into this area. Now, I'm, I'm going to be a little geeky and a little pretentious. But the true Driftless area is right here. So, so that's the true Driftless area. There is glacial drift or till uh, in this area in Iowa and Minnesotans. But for you Iowa and Minnesotans, you can still call it the Driftless area. Um, so uh, our, our organization, um, where we work, what we do, you know, we're, we're a, a land trust organization. So. Uh, we generally work in these uh, five plus counties down here in southwest Wisconsin. Uh, we were formed in about 2001. Our mission is to maintain and enhance the health, beauty, and diversity of southwest Wisconsin's driftless area uh, while connecting people to the land and to one another. Uh, so, you know, we do land conservation. We've protected about 7,000 acres, primarily through conservation agreements or easements, but uh, through land acquisition as well. And donation of land, we do partnership development. Uh, regional trail development, which I'll touch on here in a second, program delivery, special events, habitat restoration, and advocacy. And advocacy was brought to us care of American Transmission Company. So we thank American Transmission Company for that. Uh, and this is just our mission and our cool little Venn diagram, which I really love. There we go. But I'll not go over that. So uh, just talking about the unique natural resources of this region. And um, you know, I, I guess before we go there, um, I mean, I, I think all of us have you know, heard this over and over again, that this is really not needed, that there are better alternatives. Um, you know, this is a threat to ecosystems, and so on and so forth. And that's absolutely true. And I think we all know that after all this information that we've gleaned this evening and over the past couple of years and all the good work that Seoul has been doing over the years. Um, so now, you know, ATC is sort of, you know, changing their pitch. Well, it's not really need. It's about more about reliability, and um, w which was kind of interesting because I, I, I happened to, you know, a couple months ago go on and I found this U.S. World News report that sort of compared states. And I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. I'll take a look at this. Well, I, they have an energy sector, and so I looked at Wisconsin, and one of the measures is power grid reliability, and I thought, huh, interesting. So where do you all think Wisconsin ranks in terms of power grid reliability of all the 50 states? Number one. Number one in power grid reliability. <laughs> for a good reason. Yeah, we're paying for it, right? <laughs> yeah, and we're... <laughs> yeah. And, and we pay more than uh, 38 other states in terms of uh, you know, our energy consumption. And we're not really paying for energy. Of course, we're paying for transmission. Um, but uh, you know, this region is truly special. And you know, when this issue first came up, when the Environmental Law and Policy Center really started talking with us about this, 
um, it became crystal clear to our organization, why would we threaten you know, ecosystems like this for something that's not needed? Uh, you know, I mean, why would we do that? I mean, th this area, you know, there are important driftless area features like these beautiful rock outcrops, pine relic communities. These are communities that have been around since the last glaciation. So this area used to be boreal forest and tundra, tundra, then boreal forests. Uh, and these, these communities have hung on. So you have plant communities in here that are um, uh, both a mix of southern uh, plant species as well as plant species that grow up in Canada. So it's just this really fascinating assemblage of plant species. We have the Military Ridge Prairie Heritage Area and the Southwest Grasslands. The, the Southwest Grasslands area is the largest uh, grasslands in the upper Midwest outside of Kansas. And it's right here in Southwest Wisconsin. The Dodgeville, Wyoming Conservation Area is of continental importance according to Wisconsin's Wildlife Action Plan. Um, we, we have three conservation opportunity areas in the southwest grasslands. These are important bird areas. These are of uh, importance in the upper Midwest. We have land legacy sites sprinkled throughout, which uh, the land legacy plan, for those of you who don't know, was developed for DNR to identify those areas that we really wanted to target over the next 100 plus years. Uh, which would be anchors for conservation in, in, uh, throughout Wisconsin, but there are many of these throughout southwest Wisconsin. Of course, two, two state parks, the State Recreation and Black Hawk Lake Recreation Area. Uh, the Platte River is an important waterway in this area and identified in the, con it's a conservation opportunity area as well. And then of course, the Upper Mississippi National Wildlife Refuge, which this line will, will run across. And this area is a this map is a little fuzzy, and I'm sorry I did kind of a cut and paste job here, but this just gives you a sense. This is the the northern line that's been proposed, and this is just a portion of the area. And I'll get to the other part of um, Southwest Wisconsin here in a second. But this is Middleton, Wisconsin, coming out here. Uh, this is the line coming down around Mount Horeb. This is Blue Blue Mounds uh, State Park. These, this is the Military Ridge Prairie Heritage Area. This is one of our conservation easements, which will get run over by this line. Uh, there's another conservation easement that'll get run over by the line, another conservation easement that's threatened by the line. Um, this is Governor Dodge State Park, Black Hawk State Recreation Area. Taliesin is up here. Actually, before they move this line to the south, and I, I still wonder if they, if they do choose to put it on this line, if they were to get approval, which they won't get approval, um, but you would be able to see that from Taliesin. So you'd look at Taliesin in this beautiful landscape and see the towers off in the distance. And I'm sure that's what Frank Lloyd Wright had in mind. Um, so these are, these are the important bird conservation areas. This is um, the Platte, of course, the, the uh, Wisconsin River here. This is the Western Cooley Ridges ecological landscape. So this is the Dodgeville Wyoming Valley Conservation Opportunity Area. You know, Governor Dodge State Park. These are all the land legacy sites. I mean, this is just a resource-rich area. It's just littered with great stuff. Uh, this is the Southwest Savannah and Grasslands Ecological Region. Uh, but actually, um, this shows more of the region. So this is the whole region. This is this large grasslands region here. And the line would come, uh, you know, right through here and then up in uh, this area here and cut through this, actually, this area as well. And this is, you know, I, I just, you know, put in this slide because it really is an important area for grassland birds. Of course, transmission lines are great uh, perches for uh, raptors, and, and we love raptors. I love raptors, but uh, I also love endangered species. So, um, you know, uh, endangered and threatened species. And grassland sparrow, um, upland sandpiper, all sorts of really unique uh, fauna in here avian fauna. And then, of course, we have monarchs. And we know monarchs, I think their populations have declined by 70% since the 1960s. Uh, so grassland habitat is really important. And as you saw earlier from the, the presentation, or you may have seen, ATC is not managing under these lines to support uh, monarch butterflies and, and grasshopper sparrows. So in terms of tourism and economic uh, viability, this is sort of looking uh, through the Wyoming Valley to the south. This is where transmission lines would go along the northern route. Um, this is the Military Ridge State Bicycle Trail, uh, which along the southern route, if they take that one, it would run parallel with our State Bicycle Trail. 
and sort of zigzag over top of it, you know, here and there. Um, you know, but we have House on the Rock, Taliesin, Blue Mounds, Governor Dodge State Parks, you know, the Ice Age National Scenic Trail, which this will have to cut across. So my colleagues with Ice Age are talking with ATC next week, um, and I'm encouraging them to, to hold a harder line. Um, and then our project, the Driftless Trail Project, um, you know, the northern line would cut right through here, the southern line cuts right through here, uh, but our Driftless Trail project is a project, a hiking trail, about a 40 to 50 mile hiking trail that would connect Blue Mounds through Trout Creek Fishery Area, Love Creek Fishery Area, uh, down to Ridgeway Pine Relic State Natural Area, to Governor Dodge State Park, up to Tower Hill in the Laura Wisconsin Riverway, and then back. And all these blue areas are our Driftless Area Land Conservancy conservation lands, and then the green areas are DNR conservation lands. And then we don't even have in here, but there's a lot of TNC land in here. We have about 2,500 acres of conservation easements in here. And uh, TNC has, TNC and the prairie enthusiasts have about 2,500 acres in there as well. So there is just a lot of really special stuff going on in this area. TNC meaning? Oh, the Nature Conservancy. Sorry, TPE, the prairie enthusiasts. Sorry. USDA, NRCS. I'll just <laughs> throw out some more acronyms. Sorry. But this is one area, um, you know, in 2005, we worked with USDA and we worked with the Department of Natural Resources uh, to purchase a conservation easement on the Thomas barn and the Thomas property. So you may know of this property. This is Blue Mound State Park here. And this is the Thomas barn. So this was built in the 1860s, I believe. Is that right, Mark, about 1860s? But by Welsh, uh, by Welsh builders, and I, what, what I love about this is it's just this classic old stone barn, but look at that line. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So this is on the National Historic Registry. The transmission line will cut right through here. Oh. So that, that'll be a great visual juxtaposition, right? And this is, uh, this is uh, Harold Thomas. These are just north of some of the proposed lines, or of one of the proposed lines. And these are, this is a Thunderbird, if you can see this here. And here, there's the Thunderbird right here. So that's this one right here. And look at this deer. Isn't that great? Or an elk, probably. But look at, look at, look at this rock. See how fragile that rock is? When they start you know, drilling or, or drilling down and putting those pilings in, in the article that just came out in the Isthmus, they're talking about a half a million pounds of concrete for one piling. I mean, you think about that. I ran numbers. It's about 300 million pounds of concrete. We know concrete is one of the most carbon-intensive things that we do. And then you talk about the amount of steel in 625 of these towers. Then you put on the steel in the lines. You're talking about fabrication, construction, transportation. This is a carbon line period. There's nothing green about this line. And, you know, and then the, you know, the threat to destroy these, these uh, you know, archaeological gems would be a damn shame. So uh, this is where I'm a little out of my, my thing. I'm a conservation guy. Um, I, I, I was telling Rachel I had environmental law as a grad student back in about 2002, and I've forgotten everything since that time. Uh, so Rachel's here to back me up on this. But um, so what we're talking about, though, is the environmental impact statement, which um, looks like it's going to come out. We thought, actually, the environmental imp impact statement was going to come out before ATC filed. And they've sort of flipped that. And we think because th they feel a little threatened that we're gaining momentum when Dane County you know, voted 33 to 0 to oppose this line. I think that was, that was a trigger. Um, but this still should come out in likely in August, uh, but as part of the uh, NEPA process, National Environment, Environmental Policy Act, and the RUS is the Rural Utility Service. So um, Dairyland, which is one of the uh, builders, uh, one of the power companies, has applied for a grant through the Rural Utility Service. They're a federal agency, so that triggers the NEPA process. As part of that NEPA process, then they have to do this environmental impact statement. 
So we've already gone through this scoping process. That's where you know, we put in a bunch of information. So all of you or many of you have probably put in information on, in the scoping process, as did Driftless through our attorney, the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Um, the, next, uh, the next step is the draft, draft EIS public comment period. And again, we think that's likely going to be in August. So after the draft EIS is published, we have about 45 days to provide comments and input, right? So this is where we, uh, you know, when you, you, you read the statute, it says you have to be specific, right? So they want you to be specific, uh, provide as much detail as you possibly can. Um, you know, we're a resource, um, Seoul is a resource, the defenders are a resource, your local conservation people are resources. Uh, I'll, I'll get into some of, uh, some of this in a, in a second, but um, this is a great time to really uh, add public comments. So then R RUS reviews and integrates comments. That'll take about two to four months. And then the final EIS comment period uh, will have about another 30 days to comment on the selected alternative, okay? Um, and then they record, uh, the record of decision is published and we think maybe early 2019. So don't be threatened by this. This is just part of the process. They're going to, ATC is going to do what they do. They're developers, they're builders. So they're going to go through the process. But this is a political process. Uh, we will litigate, okay? So we'll take this as high as we need to go. But what's really important is to continue to build our base of support. We need more and more and more and more people because we need those. Oops. Okay, good. So we need our politicians, right? This is a political issue. This is absolutely a political issue, 100%. And uh, whether it's uh, Assembly, Senate, uh, whether it's the governor's office, we need to make this a political issue because that's exactly what it is and that's how we're gonna win this. So commenting on the draft EIS, uh, be as specific as possible on potential impacts, focus on the purpose and the need of the proposed action, um, and then environmental resources impacts include. So these are the things that you can comment on, right? So think about this, and if, if you have questions or if you want this presentation, we can send it um, and, and you can have it. Uh, but you know, geology and soils, vegetation, wetlands, wildlife, special status species, surface water and groundwater, cultural and historic resources, floodplains, paleontology, um, to find some cool, anyway, sorry. Um, air quality, uh, noise, land use, farmland, transportation, socioeconomics, environmental justice, visual resources, and health and safety, okay? So it's pretty broad on the, uh, the things that you can, uh, you can talk about in this, uh, in, during this public comment period. Uh, so these are the three ways that you can submit comments. So you can go to one of you know, the, the meetings that I think are put on by the the contractor that does the environmental impact statement, right? It's their meeting, generally. Um, so using their forms, you can send the comments to um, this comments at Cardinal Hickory Creek EIS .us, or you can mail to the consultants, which is this SWCA environmental consultants based in Pennsylvania. There you go. And then, uh, again, for information, you know, Seoul has a website, the Defenders have a website. There's a lot of great information out there. We also have in our, we have driftlessconservancy.org, which is our organizational website, but our page to this transmission project is protectthedriftless.com. So, this is, I know even less of this. Uh, this is becoming an intervener, and, and uh, Rob knows a lot about this. Um, but become an intervener in the PSC proceeding. So what is an intervener? Um, party to the proceedings with the same rights, responsibilities, and obligations as other parties, i.e. participate in formal hearings, present evidence, and witnesses. So you can become an intervener. You don't have to become an intervener. You can still attend meetings. And um, Rachel or Rob, do you want to speak to this at all? Because I'm a... She was just talking about it. You were just talking about it. That's right. So... Um, We'll talk more about that. But the thrust of Karen's thing, which I agree completely with, is that there is absolutely no reason that every person should be excluded. We have three species of this, okay? So everyone is going to intervene. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. And it's uh, 
What they say, a hundred. We have we have a measuring stick. Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty. Nice. West Virginia, they get it. <laughs> <laughs> per capita. Wow. Good, good. Well, thank you. And the other thing, too, is uh, in terms of the comments with the, the EIS, you know, we should have, you know, everybody and their neighbor should be putting in comments. You know, we want as many comments in as possible, right? Um, so how to become an intervener, uh, complete a written application called a petition to intervene. And again, this would be, uh, you know, we can, we can uh, when the time comes, um, which may be actually rather soon, um, we could have that information up and available. And you, you guys probably already have it up. In your handout on the second to last page, there's a timetable. You could probably read that. If you get your glasses on, all the information is there. Yeah. Timetable. And how, how, I mean, that timetable, it sounds like there's some flex in that timetable. About a month or so, both ways. All right. I okay. Mean, give or take. But what, we're, mm -hmm. we're, getting, we're not getting a straight answer on a lot of the questions we're asking. So. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, timing of the process, so you apply within 60 days after the PSC opens the docket, and then to receive compensation to be an intervener, you can receive compensation to be an intervener. Uh, you'd have to complete applications 14 days from the pre-hearing. Uh, so that would be laid out here soon as well. Rob, what do you, I don't know. Well, one of the things that's, uh, you know. Yeah. One of the things that's, uh, quite remarkable in the Badger Cooley hearing uh, bill was part of it is that they um, everyone who uh, who uh, intervenes in opposition to the project is forced to share the same funds so that means you're basically formed into one organization um, the the filling out the information as an organization to intervene um, is fairly elaborate process. But if you don't want to worry about the money part, all you have to do is basically say, I'm an electric customer, deal with it. So there's, we can talk a lot more about it, but you don't, you don't really have to have, uh, you know, let's put it this way, Karen's approach is the do-it-yourself approach. Uh, and it's more fun. <laughs> So other ways to get involved, and you've heard a lot about this this evening, so I'll just run through them quickly. But, you know, uh, filing comments, PSC proceedings, and attend hearings. So you don't necessarily have to be an intervener there, but as we've talked about, why not, right? Be an intervener. Uh, attend events and public meetings. Stay informed. Spread the word. Letters to editor. You know, friend to friend. Uh, meeting with your legislators. You know, getting out there. And as, as we talked about, getting letters to them, phone calls, face-to-face -face meetings. Um, we should be doing that regularly. There's no reason not to. Um, donate to and support the effort, and uh, you can follow protectthedriftless.com for information or soul or uh, Driftless Defenders. So that's all I have. Chuck Tennyson has been doing an outstanding job for Driftless as our organizer. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Chuck was one of the planners for this event. <laughs> And again, I just I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, there is hope here, right? There is hope here. Absolutely. This, this is not a foregone conclusion, and we can truly beat this thing. So thank you.